It is such an honor to be on stage here with Rochelle. Oh, also, like, feel free to like make noise on the internet on your phones. Like, I would be a total hypocrite to tell you to put your phone down. Um, but anyway, I like to start my talks with that because it's important. Yeah. Like, this is a talk about social media. Right. Um, Rochelle and I met earlier this year um, in LA. In LA, and met through Nikita Gale who's an artist that I also met on the internet. Um, and it's really fitting to like have this very like internet kind of matrix be the thing that really brought us together. Um, and so today we're gonna talk a little bit about the Witness exhibition, a little bit about what it means to ideate online, what it means to share images online, and then also about some of the conscious choices that artists and individuals make in deciding not to share images online. Um, and I think, Rochelle, you wanted to kick off the conversation. Yeah, I was um, really thinking a lot about um, this concept of uh, really being on social media to show images that we relate to this concept of witnessing. So I think a lot of us are very familiar with the ways that um, a lot of folks have been essentially showing for a lot of folks to see the police brutality incidents, um, thinking a lot about Black Lives Matter and the ways that we kind of get information about the most recent loss of life. And uh, one that I think in this idea of witnessing um, that was really striking to me that I wanted to kind of open us up to thinking about this concept of witnessing, I think we've seen a lot of these different videos that were essentially created by a person who um, is not the person who ends up in their demise. Um, but I was thinking about uh, Corinne Gaines um, specifically, who actually, for those of you who don't know, she Facebook lived uh, police coming into her house and um, they, and her son was there and she was recording him talking about the police coming into the house and she had a shotgun um, and she was basically trying to barricade her house and saying, you can't come in here, you can't kidnap me to the police, and they killed her. And um, that one in particular, I think, really started to refocus for me this concept of us showing these deaths as a, as a way of trying to, um, to really challenge what is happening, um, that it actually ends up maybe doing this opposite of um, creating a, a kind of spectacle. So that's, that was kind of what I was interested in, in starting off with, um, uh, with you, Kim, and thinking about maybe what, what are some of your thoughts on maybe the difference between like witnessing and a spectacle, essentially? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and way to frame this dialogue as well, because I think that there are a lot of concrete realities that go into documentation and into the ways in which social media allows us to respond to moments in real time, right? Um, these things happen, not instantaneously, um, but there is a different relationship to time and publishing that I think we're witnessing in this particular moment. Um, one thing though that I think about often is the relationship between authorship and witnessing um, and what it means to be present in a moment and how your relationship to the action changes, and, and kind of to your point about Corinne's story and to the story of, like, so many stories like that, right? Where, like, that person isn't necessarily the person that is killed. Um, that person is a person who is just present. Or you think about um, the work of an artist um, who is a photojournalist or something like this, and how there is an immediate economic gain at the end of this moment of documentation. Um, there's of course a huge risk if you're a vice reporter and you know first in the field and present, but then also you still might go back to your apartment in Crown Heights. Like what does that mean and how can we um, create a system that is accountable to both the truth of the moment and also the story needing to be told, the story bearing um, the weight of needing to be told. Um, and it is interesting, like I think a lot about apps, um, for example, I don't know if you've heard about this, but the ACLU has an app that yeah. like, so if you're in an altercation and you have your phone out and you use their app, 
it automatically delivers the video that you have recorded of the police or someone doing some injustice unto you and sends it to them. So if someone does take your phone, they can't delete the video. Oh, wow. Um, and so thinking about how technology can help to aid in those moments as well. Like, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a sad brilliance when people have to rely on these types of techno technologies just to say, like, this is what happened. Mm -hmm. Like, this is the truth. Um, and so I was wondering for you, too, just to, like, put a question back on you. Yeah, sure. As an artist who is engaging, not necessarily using social media as a medium in all cases, um, but for you as a, a person who makes images, what does it mean for you, especially as a black woman, mm -hmm. to share your images online? What is some of the thought process that goes into like, okay, is this body of work finished? Is that what puts it online? Or is it, okay, this body of work is urgent for this moment and now I need to publish it? Um, what, are, what are some of those thoughts for you? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I have a very um, kind of notoriously ambivalent relationship about social media where I spend an inordinate amount of time promoting exhibits or talks or different things that I'm doing, but then also will kind of go back and delete all of the images that I'm tagged in over like the course of several years. So I think even at this point, the images that I'm tagged in, I think they only go back maybe like a year and a half because I go through this. Um, and I, that actually kind of started when um, Colleen Smith, another artist, brilliant, amazing person, um, challenged me when I posted a photograph that she had seen, um, I believe either in my studio or at a show, and I posted it because I knew it was a very sexy image, it was going to get a lot of likes, it was going to be something that could kind of promote what I'm trying to do, and she um, asked me, you know, does Mark Zuckerberg own that image if... <laughs> If I put it on Facebook, and I didn't actually know the answer to the question, and I think that her question was intended to be a provocation, not to say you're supposed to do this or that, just did you consider or do you think about these things when you're posting? And once I started to understand a little bit more about the, the ways that these image archives are being stored and maybe potentially used for some pur for future purpose that we don't have, I'm very selective about which images that I put online now, I think the ones that I do put up are definitely like ready for consumption. Um, they're something that I probably would be exhibiting pretty soon. Um, I mean, I have a lot of works in my studio right now that I was just um, really having a hard time trying to decide whether or not I wanted to post them, mainly because I just don't feel like they're ready. And I, and I do wonder if this idea of needing to put oneself out there and try to promote your career or think of yourself as this kind of active practitioner um, actually creates a certain type of artwork. Like it makes people make work with the idea that eventually it's going to be something that needs to be consumed in that way. So, so I think um, for me, I'm erring on the side of caution when it comes to new work, but I do heavily promote, I think I'm more on the side of like, this is what's going on in my life type of thing, rather than here's my brand new artwork right out the studio, here, you know, comment on it, like it, heart it, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, I think a lot about, okay, so I work at the Met, every day I sit at my desk on a computer, in Facebook or Twitter or scrolling through Instagram. And so the days in which violence is inflicted and performed online, I'm very attuned to those things. Um, it's very, it was actually interesting as we were walking up because Rashayla was saying like, oh, I want to talk about Corinne Gaines. And I couldn't recall which black mom she was that had been like murdered. You know, like there was just, there's just such a high volume of violence um, where it's getting to the point where it's like almost difficult to be able to tell one story from the other. Um, and it gets to a point where not as, like, I think within the kind of like the internet of things, there's just such a wide amount of information that one can take in if they're spending a certain amount of time online. But I also think on the other side of that about what it means for me to publish online. Um, cause like outside of my work in museums, I'm really prolific on a lot of these platforms cause I'm really interested in p the performance of life, like the performance of black life as well. Um, and of course the stakes are a little bit lower at the images that I'm sharing because it's not necessarily like, I mean it is definitely intellectual property and I think that that's something that everyone should be thinking about in the audience when they're sharing on these platforms, especially with relationship to, to authorship and ownership. 
Um, but for me, it feels imperative to be able to like to show like mm -hmm. this really terrible thing happened today. Yeah. But also, I'm still here. Mm -hmm. And for me, sometimes too, even if it's you know, Kanye is visiting Trump, and like these are the five articles about it, or like here's this fake news thing. I can also see a friend just had a baby, mm -hmm. and like those are the things that like remind us that even when it feels like time stops because there has been some great violence that there's still, um, there's still life being lived. And I think so much about like, that's where kind of my like Black Lives Matter politics really shows itself the most. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering if, if Rochelle, you could talk a little bit more about the idea of consumption. Like I think about mm -hmm. um, the ways in which especially artists from particularly marginalized communities how there is a different set of expectations um, around certain months, like February and March, um, or May, uh, or September, um, and how we're, we're, as people of color, called to action in different ways, mm -hmm. um, and, and what ways do you feel like that uh, impacts your image making? Mm -hmm. um, or if, like for you, if you think about it always as and this, this being consumed, mm -hmm. so I think about like the politics of being consumed and also the politic in being indigestible, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk about what that process is, especially as your work is considered, or it considers a lot of like the outside gaze mm -hmm. um, and, and how it is um, displayed upon your body. Well, I think that's actually that whole uh, problem of, of trying to figure out um, essentially where the, the authorship is in a moment of making a photograph that leads me to making things that are performative in a sense and thinking about photography as a type of performance because when I think of it in that way it gives me a lot more freedom to occupy a variety of different roles instead of just like oh if I'm in the front of the camera I'm somehow able to be exploited or if I'm behind it like I somehow have the power um, so I think that really all of us kind of thinking about the different ways and this is something um, kind of related to what you were talking about a little bit um, when we were kind of chit-chatting earlier about how we all are getting more images than we've ever had before. And I think when we're inundated with that type of information, type of visual information, what really is happening is that we're occupying a lot of different roles in relationship to photography that perhaps historically were denied to us or were cost prohibitive. Um, anybody can make a really well composed, beautiful, high quality photograph these days. Um, and I think that it's important to consider photography within that, that idea of, of roles that are constantly shifting as opposed to I'm empowered or disempowered. Um, because honestly, I'm, I'm at the point where I think that there's been a lot of conversation in photography, especially when it comes to like the marginalized of I'm using photography to empower myself. I want to make visible people like me because we're no long, we haven't been considered a part of this canon or whatever the case may be, uh, this archive. And I think now we really have to critically engage that concept. Like, does that actually, does that visibility automatically assume that you'll have some sense of empowerment? Or is there another role that you can occupy in relationship to photography than I've been the victim and now I have to like vindicate myself? Yeah, that's true. I think a lot, I mean, on the other side of this too, we were talking earlier or thinking um, ahead of this talk about speaking specifically about what it means to be a black body moving online as either the person who's pushing the pixels or the person who is being composed by the pixels and, and what that means. And I, I, think, I often think about um, virality, right? And how our images move quickly and how I, I have a lot of friends who are internet famous. Um, and I'll see them tweet something and then you, you get the meme and it's like their account is cropped out or like the Shade Room will repost something that my friend Doreen sent out and it's no longer Doreen's tweet, mm. it's the Shade Room's tweet, but then like also the Shade Room is a black owned company and so like how deep can it get in terms of like ownership and, and, and visibility mm -hmm. um, and what does it mean to be, visi be made visible when, when you're not ready for it or there's not like I think that we also have this like kind of capitalist view of visibility that I think is difficult, especially mm -hmm. um, for black peoples, because a lot of the, the black people that we see readily are like 
the superstars or the athletes mm -hmm. and like Ben Carson before he was awful. Um, like there's yeah. just very few examples and modes of, of being like a highly visible black person, right? Right. And then now you have like the Vine kids, like R.I.P. Vine. Um, <laughs> but in what ways is like Jay Farrow, mm -hmm. you know, the young man who like did all of the, okay, he like does Sound these amazing, old, like yeah. Anita Baker covers. Um, <laughs> In what ways is he empowered and in what ways is he able to control his image? Mm -hmm. um, and is that something that we should reserve? Like, I wonder so much too about like how we can, like where that impetus comes from, you mm -hmm. know? And I guess it's like kind of in that continuum of the history of documentary photography, like, you know, Jacob Breeze showed us this truth mm -hmm. and then it created this fight, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like, for you, what what made you want to go into showing your images, like from a for, like from a younger age? Like, mm -hmm. was it about this means of empowerment? Like, is it something for you particularly that made you see that shift um, from like or like wanting to question um, power in images and representation? I think that's what initially drew me to photography is this idea that I wanted to kind of make myself, that I wanted to be able to have the control over my image that I perceive that people ultimately should have. Um, but I think that now that I've done a fair bit of showing of those types of images, I'm not 100%, I, I don't believe that I approach like the act of making a photograph with this idea of needing to kind of control my image or empower myself anymore. I don't think that that's, I think that's a really dubious concept. And I think that there's a lot of people who have made really beautiful, fantastic work that's based off of that premise. And the social issue that is tied to whatever they're making images about remains. So the question is, what next? Um, so for me, I think that that's like kind of where I'm at now. It's like, what next? Not how do I make myself kind of look like an empowered individual? And I think um, when it comes to like internet celebrity, the thing I think that's happening in a lot of people's kind of framework around like what is image making and how is this empowering to me is that they, they already know that these images are going to be proliferated anyway, so they want to figure out a way to try to capitalize on their image being monetized, which I think is, is noble in a type of way, but also in the end, what you're saying is, is that your, your value is ultimately kind of a monetary one. Um, so that's the one that, that feels very, um, or the, the kind of approach that feels very uh, troubling to me and I think ultimately leads me to other media in addition to photography. Because I don't refer to myself as like photographer, performance artist, or like, you know, kind of silo myself in that way. I just say I'm an interdisciplinary artist. And so whenever I'm engaging with whatever media, I usually am talking about the process of looking. But there's a lot of ways to look at something other than through this apparatus. Um, which essentially what the camera is, it's like a, it's like a prosthetic in a way, it's like a prosthetic eye. Um, and it sees things in a way that you're not going to see them in the way that you experience them. Like the picture of the situation always is different than how you experience that. Um, I mean, but you know, there's some people who say that you are internet famous too. So I'm interested, <laughs> I mean, Really, like how does that, like how would that kind of characterization make you feel about the images that you're making or the way that you're operating in popular culture in addition to this kind of, this world that we are in and the art world that's sometimes a little like separate from that. Because um, I feel like that, that kind of balance that you're kind of like, kind of writing right now is really what's interesting to a lot of folks who probably wouldn't perceive themselves as needing to be visual, visible in that way, like a curator or um, a writer or a critic or someone who's like kind of perceived as like an administrator in, in the arts.
Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. It's one that I, I actually think a lot about, too, in working at the Met, because it's an institution that's 140 years old, and there are a lot of people who um, have a lot of the ideals from 140 years ago, mm, right? Mm. Um, and so there's <laughs> questions like, why do we use the internet? Like, why do we have a website? Like, who built this anyway? <laughs> um, and I have a deep respect for that, you know, because, like, you know, everybody's, everybody, like, I love Luddites. I'm like, if you hate the internet, awesome. Like, let's talk about it. Like, what specifically do you hate? Because yeah. it's not the whole thing. And, like, there's some things that I take issue with, too. Right. Um, and I think that those are those spaces. I mean, it's always good to talk to people who don't agree with you. That's just, like, how I was raised. Mm -hmm. um, but in, term, in terms of the way that I, I live my life within the arts, for me, it's really, I'm interested in presenting possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, and I have for a very long time been invested in that. I don't know where I got that crazy idea from, but it's been working so far. Mm -hmm. um, I think so much about how my path towards success was not one that was particularly linear. Mm -hmm. There wasn't like someone who was like, let me take your hand from this internship to <laughs> the Met. Like right. no one's doing that for little black girls in the art world. Like that's yeah. just not what the deal is. Right. And so for me, I'm, I'm really interested in showing like it can be a path that looks like this, mm -hmm. you know, and that all of those things matter and all of those things inform the story. And so I like to publish at each stage so that people can see. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily as a means of saying like, you too should want to do this because like my life is cute, but it's like not as fun as it looks on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if it can in inform the passion that you have then that's the goal for me, is that it incites this fire in you and that people can understand that there's a value in that. And then moreover, I'm interested in sharing other people's stories um, because I believe so much in celebrating minutia, right? Mm -hmm. and, and being able to look at these little moments in time as, as like parts of those paths. And so if there's an ability for me to take someone else's step and be able to shine a, a light on that as a means of saying like, okay, this artist was working on this in 2014 and then now they're like, have this amazing show and this amazing place. And not to say that I like take any credit for it because I 100% don't, but just being able to say like, this is a part of a continuum. Like this is not just a person who's making something for your shitty art fair in yeah. you know, Eastern Europe. Right. Like this is a person who has a practice that is full and this person is reading more books than you could ever imagine. Um, and I want people to, to look at these kind of people, these cast of characters in, in my social media and, and just think more in more complicated ways, especially about artists of color, because I don't know that we're in, in a discipline that allows for that kind of thought mm -hmm. and imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's what social media affords us to a certain degree too. Yeah. Like I think a lot about and how, in, how in your work taps into the gaze and taps into this like idea of fantasy because you both like are an individual in the images, but then also like presenting this universe that is not that at all. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an incredible amount of agency in being able to build narrative and work, but also that you're tapping into to this, this imagination. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how, like especially, because you were mentioning before that you've moved away from just like photography and performance and into other mediums and mm -hmm. what that means for you now, especially as a person who is public. Mm. Like, what does it mean for you to journey into something new yeah. with this kind of, within this kind of infrastructure of accountability, if you could call it that? It's super nerve wracking. <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of having a little crisis in my studio right now, um, thinking about, and I think this is what artists do. Like, we go through like many crises all the time, you know, we're like sitting in there like, oh no, <laughs> did I like paint myself into a corner with the work that I've made so far? Now I can't go and do this other thing. Um, or how do I create a path for me to get to this other thing that kind of makes sense to people who are not here in this process with me? Um, so it's been very, I, I've been starting to get to the point where I do feel like, like I'm about to have one of those, like, I need to get off the internet moments um, just so that I can, like, have the time to breathe and think about what's happening in my work without this public gaze. Um, but... But then I think that that's like really dramatic also. <laughs> and I could probably just not post or not log in and just leave it at that for a while, you know, while I'm working on my work. So um, I think 
the way that young artists are participating in the art world now is a lot, and when I say the art world, it's like, that's a very problematic term, but I think ultimately I'm talking about like spaces that are institutionally validated in some type of way, have resources, um, <laughs> because I can think of a lot of places where art is being made where people don't consider that the art world. But ultimately, I think um, engaging with the pla these places where now we have visible models of success that are also coming from different communities. We have our superstars of every like you know race you can imagine um, from throughout the world. You have major art stars, and a lot of them are fairly young. Um, and I think that creates a lot of anxiety for people in a way that's kind of, it's, it's very typical, you know? It's like you compare yourself to other people, it makes you feel bad about yourself. Even if you're better than them in their comparison, eventually you'll find somebody who's like better than you, and so like the cycle will perpetuate itself. So I think that whole idea of, um, of needing to be able to be really present with the work um, and really trying to not look at I mean, because you even were talking about how like your life looks more interesting on the internet than it does in real life. I say that to people all the time. They're like, oh, you were just in Johannesburg, or you were just in whatever. And I'm just like, yeah. And I was also just like in my pajamas for like five days, you know, trying to like pull myself together, you know? <laughs> and it was really hard. Um, and, and those are things that I'm not going to show on the internet because that's not the kind of persona that I'm necessarily like cultivating. Um, and I think that's another thing that's crazy. Like, we have to think about the persona that we're cultivating. Like, I know my persona is like jet setting, like professional, but like a little kooky. Um, what else? Real like family person. Um, always wearing leopard print and a lot of crazy outfits. I mean, that's like, like I'm aware of how I look to people and that kind of concept really is like double consciousness, like, on steroids, and I think that a lot of people who probably wouldn't perceive themselves as being like a part of the double consciousness rhetoric are now going to be because like social media, social media is making all of us have this like process of looking at ourselves from other people's standpoint or other people's views of us. Yeah, it's so weird how we perform online. Like I think I'm thinking about like what you're saying in terms of the performance on the internet and how that might relate to recording these incidents of violence mm -hmm. and like what that means because I think okay so you guys read the news right because you know this talk happened so you're on some sort of the internet um, <laughs> I think a lot about how people are like in now more than ever like after <laughs> Tuesday or they're like in this year where all these awful things happen and it's right. like yeah 2016 was like a hot bag of fiery garbage yeah um like Prince died like no question about it right right oh but so many of these really terrible things are one a part of a system right so like let's just get real like these things don't happen as totally isolated incidents like the ways in which people read certain bodies on the street is just something that we're hardwired to do mm -hmm. watch the 13th um, when you get home if you haven't already um, yeah. and I, I think so much about how social media has instead of saying instead of saying that like social media is a vehicle for being able to better visualize black pain but it's just like a different way of performing it right mm -hmm. like it's a different um, or, or a kind of more nuanced way of performing what a black life lived can be, and sometimes that shit is difficult. Um, and sometimes, like, other lives are difficult as well, but this is the technology that we read into truth now in the way that traditionally maybe we have, would have totally relied on photography to do, mm -hmm. or, you know, like, you know, I was in Baltimore yesterday and there's the Afro-American newspaper, which is like one of the oldest black newspapers in the country, yeah. how that was like the way of being able to tell these stories. Or you think about Chicago, Johnson Publishing Company. Um, Defender. The, exactly. Mm -hmm. Like this is now just like our way of being able to say like, hey, <laughs> like this is what it looks like from this side of the table because there is difference. Like. Yeah. I don't know, I'm curious about like that performance and, and, and what it means, especially too like as an artist that performs, um, if you could maybe talk about your relationship to an audience and how mm -hmm. you enter into 
like a moment of performative gesture and like what that process looks like beforehand, especially knowing like, you know, if you were to perform in 2017, like mm -hmm. what kind of considerations might go into the way that you set the ground rules for the space that you're performing in? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think with performance in general, it's always like the first thing you have to know is the context, like what, what's been going on in this space before I got here? What are people thinking about? What are they talking about? Am I like being pro brought to like solve a problem? <laughs> like lack of diversity, <laughs> you know? <laughs> or, or am I like, you know, being brought in as like a responder to somebody else's thing instead of like, you know, like I'm like a, I'm a frontline responder, you know, instead of like <laughs> someone who would be impacted by these things. Um, so I think that's like the first set of questions that I have to be able to answer. And for all the curators out there, if you're ever interested in curating performance, please make sure that your performance artists have that context. Because I've been in so many situations where it's like you're just kind of thrown in the middle of something and then you don't really know what that information is or it was presented to you in a way that wasn't making the work be able to develop kind of on the ground, so to speak. And so I think that that's the relationship to the person bringing me in is probably the most important thing or the group of people or the institution. And then also, if I know that there's going to be a certain kind of racial dynamic, that's really important to me to know that. Um, I can't do the same exact performance for a room of black people that I do for a room of white people or a mixed group of people or a group of Asian people or, you know, like a group of people who are in art school versus people who are coming in off the street. Like, those are all things that are really important to know. And then from there, I kind of go off into a back room <laughs> or wherever I'm staying and just kind of incubate those ideas and really think about how I'm going to disrupt any assumptions that people have about what a person like me would do in that context. So that's because I'm like more interested in like provocateur, you know, kind of roles, like, or people who you can't tell if they're performing. I'm really interested in like Tanya Bruguera's work. I love Theaster Gates's work. I mean, I just think about a lot of people who are just like, is this a performance or is this you being yourself? And so I'm really interested in the ways that that type of work is able to occupy a lot of different spaces, but like the, the artists will like tune it a little bit differently. So I'm learning that. I've only been doing live performance probably for like, I don't know, two and a half years. Um, so I feel very fresh in that. But I think it's the same thing that we all do when we're in a social situation, when we're all learning how to occupy a space. And some of us are better at that than others. Um, or at least <laughs> we know how to get people to do what we want in those situations better than others. Um, and so I think my whole goal is to try to draw that process to people's attention. To be like, you could just as easily be here on this stage talking and I'm going to go sit in the audience and you can figure this out. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that... Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot about that, especially, and this is like kind of an odd tangent, but it makes me think about the ways in which we read gender in public space, mm -hmm. where people are like, oh, I didn't know you were a they. And I was like, you didn't know this person. Mm -hmm. Like, you didn't know this person before you met this person. Right. So, like, give gender a chance. Right. Like, also, it's a myth. Like, yeah. also, what if we, just when we encountered people, just allowed mm -hmm. for this moment of, of, of reading? Like, and as a, as a means of like becoming a more literate people in the way that we engage with others and in other. Mm. Um, so that's, yeah, that's really interesting to think about. Because um, I've been to so many performances where, like, especially performances where, and there's this assumption about how I want to respond to the truth of our times, where it's just like, I actually don't want to see you perform death. Like, yeah. Or I was at the Blacks and Wax Museum in, in, in Baltimore um, yesterday or two days ago, and they were like, don't you want to go to the lynching exhibition? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not trying to mess up my Monday. Like, like I know that history, and I respect it. I respect the display of it, right. but I also, like, took an entire semester on Ida B. Wells and, like, just will break down and mm -hmm. not come back. Like, right. and that's a thing that, and, and a right that I reserve to take up that much space. 
Um, and I think about that too, like to your point earlier about like wanting to have this like grand moment of being like, I'm deactivating. Like right. I always be like so ready to be like, I'm deleting my gram. <laughs> and, like, some people will care, some people won't, but like it's such an interesting- A lot of people will care. It's an interesting like thing to do. Like I love the drama. Yeah. Like I love like right. the constant threat where you're like, like <laughs> either like these platforms won't exist anymore like Vine. Yeah. Or like I'm gonna delete it. Yeah. And like life will go on. You don't know, it's like, it's, it's an interesting thing which has nothing to do with this talk. Um, no, I think it is relevant. Yeah. It actually makes me think about um, two artists that I've really been thinking about a lot that I wanted to kind of bring into this conversation. Um, David Leggett's show at Gallery 400. I think there's a couple more days left on that. If y'all haven't seen it, go. It's going tomorrow. so good, so good. Um, but just to, for the sake of us having a conversation about it, um, uh, David has a blog and he every day is posting drawings and a lot of times they're in response to things that people ask him to draw on the, on the, the Tumblr blog. And a lot of these, like he has, a, so that for that reason, he has a very active social media presence in that sense, but you're not gonna see him personally posting a lot of details and minutia of his day-to-day -day life. And if you do see any of those details, it's gonna show up in his work, that you'll see that, you know, in the painting and the gallery. And, um, and Martin Sims also makes work about net art and essentially this concept of like what is like a, a black net art aesthetic. But she doesn't have a social media presence other than like a Twitter where she just will very occasionally post things that are just, they're not even like super interesting to what we quite honest. I mean, no shade, but you Don't know. Don't be talking just, about my girl. I mean, I'm just saying, like they're just kind of like, <laughs> they're just real, okay, simple. It's, it wasn't like trying to be something really you know, climactic or super. It's kind of like an anti-performance. Exactly. And, um, and I know that she's really interested in that concept of anti-performance as well. And I love um, Fred Moten's notes on non-performance and blackness um, as well. But yeah, but I'm, I have been thinking about that. The artists who are making work specifically about the internet or some kind of engagement with it, but they don't actually post the minutia of their day-to-day -day life on the internet and what that type of relationship to, like, I don't know, I wonder if I wasn't posting myself and my image and my family and my vacations, would that then kind of make me feel like, oh, there's like some space to make work about the internet? Because in the space that I'm in right now, I don't really feel truly compelled to make work about the internet. I mean, I think it's really like a matter of personal preference. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times people are like, I get the question, where do you, like, what's the future of the internet? I'm yeah. like, I don't know. Like, I, I just, like, tomorrow where I get on it again, like, mm -hmm. in the day after, like, Twitter changed where the images don't count in the characters, and it, like, mess, like, it's still messing me up. Like, right, <laughs> Abraham? Like, you got an extra 24 characters. It's amazing. It's, like, the best thing, but, like, for the longest, we were waiting for this thing to happen, and it was, like, not gonna happen, and then it did, so now I'm just like, this changes my entire job. Um, but. <laughs> As an aside, yeah, I mean, I don't think that everybody necessarily has to make work about the internet. Like, that would get so boring, oh my yeah. god. But I do think that if, if there is a criticality to which we bring to our engagement with all of these things that we've become so readily dependent on, mm -hmm. it's definitely necessary. Like, I think a lot about, especially now, um, like the politic of screen time, where like sometimes adults like don't let little people be on the computer because it melts their brains, where it's just like, no, like maybe not. Like maybe mm -hmm. like we understand that the technology and, and this digital world has is very much a mirror of things that we've always been engaging with and thinking through. Mm -hmm. And like we need to bring a critical lens, like even if this is a child, to what these things do and mean in the world. Right. Um, like our president is on Twitter. Like that's just a fact. That's unfortunately yeah. not going away. Yeah. Um, and so like maybe we should talk more critically about what these mediums do, where they come from, and how they've operated over time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I don't think you necessarily have to, but if you want to, you should. I'd love <laughs> to see that. <laughs> well, I think that the only ways that I would be interested in it is if there would be like some alternative platforms, not the ones that are like the major corporations. So like no Tumblrs, no Twitters, no Facebooks, no, I don't know, LinkedIn's, Sinkingarrangement.com. I don't know. You black know. people meet. <laughs> black people meet. I miss Black Planet. Oh, 
I miss it so much. Okay, so I was a really huge, crazy BlackPlanet.com person. I actually found my first girlfriend from BlackPlanet. That's a beautiful. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, Black Planet did a lot for people. But yeah, I think that those types of... It's true, <laughs> it's true. Like, look, up, look it up. Like, there's this guy named Omar Wasau, who's a black person who founded Black Planet. He's also the first person to help Oprah send her first email. It's historic. It really is. They also had uh, mihente.com and Asian it? Avenue. Yes. Yeah, they were all owned by the same company. There's Downlink. Do you know Downlink? It was no. a queer one. No, I didn't know I that. Oh, okay. But anyway. <laughs> so anyway, whole point being, um, just different types of platforms that may be potentially underground, um, I think would be kind of interesting. I would like to see this D, I don't know, uh, just something where we kind of disrupt a little bit this, the mass corporation owning all social media thing. I think that that's kind of the place where we're at. We need that back. But I think we're getting a little warning time. So, um, is this on? Yeah. So, um, we've got 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, I have a microphone. If you, if you want to throw out some questions, I'm happy to bring it around. Just flag me down. Questions? And up front? Oh. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned that you tune your performance to the space that you are performing in. And I'm curious for both of you, what are the ways in which you tune your online performances on these social media platforms? Do you restrict it to certain audiences? Do you have in interactions with folks who you didn't realize were in your network or were following you? Um, and how do you deal with that? Well, yes. <laughs> I have a restricted category. <laughs> For some people, <laughs> and uh, some of those are, people are related to me. Um, I think because they post too much. So, like the random auntie who doesn't know how to stop. You love her. You don't want to unfriend her, but she she doesn't understand the the purpose. Or maybe she does understand the purpose of the internet. Do you, do you have people in your family that post Bible memes? Does anybody in the audience have a family member that posts Bible memes? Thank you, James, yes. in the front. Yes. My mom is yes. all about that. <laughs> and it like, I'm just like, oh my God, what? It was like one that was like, does it matter who is elected because Jesus is king? And I was just like, <laughs> like what? Did Jesus you, take what? the wheel? <laughs> Where did you get that from? I'm sorry. You're... <laughs> Do you, do you have a restricted category? I do. I totally do. I feel like you would have to. Yeah, no, I do. It's, it's relatively new. Like, I have a, a Facebook group that I started called Very, Very Rare, and it's specifically oriented around information sharing amongst people of color, um, and the only people who can be in the group are people of color, and so it's like, there's like 400 and, like, between 400 and 500 people in it, so it is, like, pretty public, but in scale with the other sides of the communities I engage with, it's quite small. Um, but yeah, I like to reserve that space as one where it's just like, this is really an unapologetic space for sharing these particular types of things. Um, and it's not about like necessarily being like super irreverent, but just like being really selective about engagement. Um, but otherwise I'm pretty public and I, I think very critically about things before I publish them and they're like just fun stuff things that happen in my life that I want to share, but I know that they're of very low consequence. Like, I definitely put um, Rochella eating a red velvet cupcake on Instagram Live before we came downstairs. I'm like, it's like a low stakes game, you know? Um, but I, you know, I think a lot about like images, especially of my body on, online too. And so I, I definitely think about like restricting those kinds of weight, like images in the world, especially, or thinking about like, if I sit for a portrait, like who I choose to sit for, um, as aside from social media, something that I think r really <laughs> way too much about, mm. and like almost this like, totally trying to resist narcissism way, but just like thinking about how I want to be remembered, especially at this like age in my life, and like what that looks like is something that, that I'm always constantly kind of ruminating on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Any more questions? So something you said about these restrictions on your social media accounts made me think about my daughter who's gonna kill me. <laughs> she's applying for colleges and she's, the, the idea of safe spaces has come up a lot. 
which I graduated from SAIC in 2007. So the concept of safe spaces is still somewhat new to me. Um, so I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on the necessity of the authenticity of like, should we be looking for safe spaces? Do safe spaces really exist? How much does it matter? Like in relation to social media and IRL. <laughs> okay. I can answer it too. I much. mean, it's, yeah, I, so my day job is the Director of Student Affairs for Diversity at SAIC, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And there, the, the concept of a safe space is like a higher education, like, Lingo, lingo, it's like a, a concept that has become very popular in higher ed specifically. I don't personally believe that it's possible to guarantee a safe space, and so I've kind of started to refrain from using that specific language. I think a lot of people are starting to talk about the concept of like a brave space. So we're showing up, we're doing our best, we're gonna make mistakes, and you have to be brave, and you have to deal with that. Um, I think that there are still legitimate like spaces where we can kind of come together with people that we feel, you know, share our interests and care about us. And we that that's kind of up to each person to determine what that safe space is. I don't know if the institution necessarily can guarantee that space for you. I think it's and I encourage my students to do this all the time. It's like you need to find your people. You need to connect with the folks who get you who understand, and then y'all need to like go and do something, <laughs> you know, because you can't be relying on the person who's like the beleaguered, you know, diversity job guy or whatever, you know, to like do that work because it's not always about that. It's about actually creating that sense of, I mean, the, the really overrun word community. But it really, I, I think that that really is, but that, those are my feelings about that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like. The first time I heard the phrase like safe space is a myth was like a bell hooks moment. Like she was talking at the new school and I was like, yeah, I guess when bell hooks says it, I kind of am like, well, what even is a safe space? Like, <laughs> I should like convince you of some stuff that like you believed your whole life. Right. Um, but yeah, no, I think, I think what's really, especially as you're entering into an undergraduate institution, what's really most paramount is that you feel like in, your, in a space that you can be empowered um, but I think that the greatest gift that you can have, especially as a young person, is just constantly auditing the spaces that you're in. Like, if it doesn't feel right, trust yourself. Yeah. Like, you do not yeah. want to be surprised because you've, like, trusted too much in a space. Do not trust institutions. Like, you use institutions as a means of doing something else. Um, college is four years or six or seven. It doesn't matter. Like, t take your time. <laughs> um, but it really is about understanding, like, that you are there for a purpose and you want to be in community spaces that aid in that purpose and if there is um, a, a feeling of like there's not people who are on that team like find like find your people is really an important thing um, aside from that I do think that one of the dialogues that's really interesting on college campuses that I'm more interested in is the concept of the safe haven campus and thinking about immigration policies so mm -hmm. I think that that might be a really good conversation to have with admissions officers um, in relationship to how they're treating undocumented students on their campuses mm -hmm. that'll give you a lot more information than a safe space question that's really, really important. Yeah, I agree. Hi. Hi, just one more question. Um, I was just, you mentioned earlier about how looking at social media all day and seeing the violence all the time and how you see that on a daily basis. My question is, how do you find the balance between your own personal self-care and um, taking on that responsibility of getting all of this violence and all of these hard and heavy topics out to other people in a, a more um, digestive way for them. So how do you have that balance yourself with your own self-care and these heavy topics that you're dealing with? Yeah, it's really about pacing. Thank you for your question, it's amazing. Um, I love that like 2016 was the year we all like mobilized and militarized around self-care. It's like so dope. Um, like I just don't feel like there was time like this before, but anyway, um, or in my lifetime specifically, I'm sure it was happening before that like obvi. Um, for me, yeah, it's really more about pace. Like f two years ago, if you had asked that same question, I thought a lot about like, okay, have I seen a lot of people sharing this particular story or this particular video? 
I don't need to share it because I know someone else has. And I kind of have that politic in a lot of things where like I don't want to overshare on things that I know are already making people feel a certain way. Um, but I also think a lot about like find like to that other question about like just finding your people. Like for me, I know immediately who to call when things hit the fan. Like I'll just like call Morgan Parker and be like, hey, and like from the hey, she knows what's up, you know. Um, so finding those people who can be um, present for you or the people who like, you know, you can just have a conversation about like apples and they know that like you're in a moment of crisis. Um, like the people who like really know you the best and, and I think that that's a, a lifelong process and one that like you have to continue to audit. Um, but for me that's kind of my modus and also I, I this year started to do more collaborative projects and that's really aided in my self-care practice because you're able to, like for me I like want to do everything all the time. Like I am in a constant pursuit of excellence and I'm really unapologetic about it. Um, but I also know that working in collective groups that I can be able to share with others some of the burden of that even if for a moment and that freedom to know like someone else can carry this load for just a day is freeing. Like that is how like the new choreography of my life is really run right now. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Hi, thank you guys for speaking. Um, my question is about, I guess, the role of social media in witnessing um, some of the really violent and brutal events that we've, we've seen and experienced um, and heard about. I guess I'm wondering, um, do you think social media augments um, physical conversations, you know, in real time, real life between two people? Does it augment that conversation or in some instances, does it usurp physical conversation in the sense of, you know, we're talking about these issues on social media, but people aren't talking about it physically, or maybe some other third option, you know, maybe there are pros and cons um, either ways. Could you talk about that a little bit? I mean, I think you just named all the ways that that can happen. I think that it depends on the people. Um, like Kim was saying, it's a I'm sorry, I don't even know if you go by Kim and I've just been calling you that. Okay. You get it. <laughs> right. Um, was saying it's a personal choice, you know, and I think that it kind of depends on, like there's some keyboard thugs, you know, that if you saw them in real life, they would just totally back down. Um, and then there's some people who are gonna be doing that and they will be doing that in real life. So I don't, I think it kind of depends on each individual um, really. And I think maybe what's, um, also kind of behind your question a little bit is this idea of um, each person kind of being able to plug into human interaction when they feel like that's what's, what they need. And I've definitely like shut down conversations on my page when I was like, you know what, y'all need to get in person, the two of y'all, because y'all are doing all this on my wall and I don't like it, I don't want people getting upset, I don't want anybody to get hurt, love both of you, deleting this. Um, and I know that that's like something that a lot of people would perceive as like really aggressive, but that's, that's because I don't want that kind of drama on my, on my page. But I think everybody has to kind of figure out what their own barometer is, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's an issue too of proximity because I think for me, like I'm a person who has anxiety. I struggle with it. I don't like big groups um, unless I'm like on a stage, like this is totally chill. Um, but for me, like going to a police sanctioned protest is actually the worst thing possible. Um, I don't feel safe in those spaces. I don't feel empowered in those spaces. I don't feel seen nor heard nor felt. Um, and I think that a lot of times that's what resistance looks like, especially in New York. Like every time something happens, we're like, we're going to Union Square. And it's just like, I'm not. Like I'm not going to Union Square. Yeah. But I know that if I can be a purveyor of information about an issue with the platform that I have, that feels really urgent to me. And so I'm always really sensitive to critiques of social media as this like sovereign island where nothing is possible because I do really think that the ways that images are transferred online inform the, the actions that can be taken later. 
Um, I also think about like issues like in the Middle East or like thinking about like my relationship and understanding of Aleppo where like that is totally funneled through social media and if people weren't sharing those things I just wouldn't be abreast of that information and as a person who spends as much time within social media spaces as I do I'm thankful for that information and it's hard to digest and I'm not exactly sure what I can do to make change about it but I'm I'm so glad to know that it's happening and perhaps like in the same way that I'll see a video of of you know something atrocious, I'll see a Facebook group of people who are assembling in, in small groups to talk about these issues together, and people who are really informed may come, and people who may be ignorant about issues can come, but have really fleshed out dialogue in a space that isn't particularly surveilled in the way that social media spaces can be. So I think it really is about like understanding how complicated that can be for everyone, and then also that like it happens more than just like in these immediate circles. So thank you for your question. We've got time for just two more questions. All right. So I was wondering, as someone that manages social media for another agency, when you are done doing that, how do you maintain sort of your desire to even do it personally? And do you think it's necessary sort of in the way that social media is emerging to have a very public personal platform in order to gain sort of career success? Yeah, I, I don't necessarily think it's like having a social media presence is like vital to success in the arts. It's just the path that I've chosen. Um, I'm really, I mean, so like I work at the Met. The Met is 140 years old. The Met treats 5,000 years of art history. The Met is an encyclopedic collection and so it represents many, many different cultures. And I am 26 and represent my black queer self. And so the stories are just vastly different. Um, and so I don't necessarily see it as like one stops and, and one begins, um, but there's just a lot of different stories that I'm able to channel and, and use these mediums to portray and purvey in the world. Um, but to the point about having a social media presence is really just like what you have the bandwidth to do in your life. Like I've made it so that my bandwidth is that like I'm out here. Like, if there's a meter, like, I'm here on out here, and that's just something that I've committed myself to, but it's not necessarily everyone's path. Like, if you just love, like, if you take to Instagram and that's the one you like, like, go for it. If you, if you take to, like, Flipboard because you love stories and you know that you can find the best interviews online and you want to, like, use that to do that, like, go for it. But I think that a lot of times people think about digestion of social media or on this onboarding process as this, like, really behemoth thing, and it's really just finding, like, the right way to tell the story that you want to tell. And it, and it is about finding the stories that you feel urgent and that you, like, because that is what keeps you committed. Because, uh, like, I'm five years into this, and, like, I'm down. Like, I want to keep it going. Um, but that's because I found a thing that I love, and I feel very lucky for that. Um, so if there's something that, some story that you want to communicate, like, go for it. Just make sure that you find something that works for you. Because, like, at the end of the day, like, you are the one who's going to be a part of all of that. And I think people often forget that, too. Got the last question right here. We got a pump fake in the front. Okay. <laughs> she wanted to ask, oh, who's your favorite artist? She kept asking me and oh. <laughs> really wanted to. Wow, that's a really tough question to answer. Um, the, I mean, I would probably say the only person I've ever been like a fan of was Prince. <laughs> yeah, he's my favorite artist. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I don't really have one right now. I hate answering like, who's your favorite artist? But yeah, it's a difficult, it like shouldn't be so hard because like, there's so many great ones in the gallery over there. I encourage you all to go see the show after this. Um, but I mean, I guess like if I'm cheating, I could say Dawood because he's amazing. Um, he's a person who, I mean, like Rochelle, like I love any artist that's had a career as a teacher. Um, I think that that work is really necessary and vital and, and like almost a silent kind of work that happens in the arts. So look up to your teachers and know that they have lives outside of school too. <laughs> um, and that, that, I don't know, that informs a lot. Like I think about how many artists that Dabo has touched in his career. Like 
Carrie Mae Weems. You know, it's like, whoa! Or like someone like Charles Gaines um, yeah. and like his time at Fresno. Like there's, there's just so many artists, too many artists to count. Um, and sometimes I like cheat and say like my favorite artist is the artist I don't know yet, but that's like a, a answer that makes me want to like <laughs> die inside. Um, but yeah, thank you for your question. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Um, uh, thank you, Kim. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you, Anne. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hope to see you next Tuesday.